Okay, so we move forward uh, with News 2 joint session uh, with Korean and Japanese bifurcation clubs. We have uh, as uh, co-chair uh, Yves Louvar here and also on uh, remote connection Angela Hoy. And uh, we have as a distinguished panelist uh, Mirvat Alashnag, I don't see her, probably she is going to connect, Joanna Viskoska. Uh, the friend Guon Abid Sali and the other friend Giulio Guagliumi from Italy. So uh, the, the first presentation will be by Yoshi Murasato, a very active uh, bifurcation researcher, and uh, it will be on the feasibility and efficacy of the ultra short side branch dedicated balloon in coronary bifurcation stenting. Thank you for invitation to. EBC 2021. I am Yoshino Brunasato from Kyushu Medical Center in Japan. My topic is the feasibility and efficacy of the ultra short side branch dedicated balloon in coronary bifurcation stenting. It is my disclosure slide. Hot and side branch dilation has been reported its superiority over final kissing balloon inflation in terms of less overstretch like over shape, less stent obstruction in the side bench ostium, and less malar position in the bench testing. However, the side bench dilation with the long balloon has a risk of stent deformation indicated in this slide, uh, so uh, we propose uh, using a short balloon, ultra short balloon uh, for the dedicate uh, for the side branch, glider balloon. We usually use the four meter length balloon. Uh, this is a unique uh, for the side branch direction. And uh, this balloon has a trucable for the reorientation of the tip of wave uh, from the obstacle, optimal side branch ostium expansion without damaging the side, this uh, side branch and minimize the uh, member sustained the deformation. This is a bench testing to compare the conventional side branch dilation by a long balloon and that by a short balloon. In the conventional side branch dilation, guide wire deviation to the inner side at the side branch ostium is maintained during balloon inflation and the stent deformation in the opposite side of the side branch is likely to occur due to balloon straightening. Side branch dissection mm -hmm. and the stent matter position at the cardinal side are also likely to occur. On the contrary, side branch dilation with a short balloon could correct the guide wire deviation and provide optimal side branch osteous size dilation with less stent deformation and side branch injury. This is a test for over dilation of the balloon dilated at 14 atmosphere in the hard stentic region. Either 4 or 6 mm balloon did not show the dilation over the compressed cap, while over dilation, so called dog form phenomenon, occurred in the long balloon. It suggests short balloon is superior to long balloon for sufficient side branch osteo expansion and rest injury. Recently, our study concerning the side branch dedicated ultra short balloon, glider balloon, has been published in the Euro Intervention. This is a single center prospect prospective observational study. We enrolled the 194 patients in the 207 regions, and the average age is 70 years old, and the higher prevalence of the male gender hypertension, dyslipidemia in 80% and uh, diabetic meritus uh, is also frequently observed 40% and acute coronary syndrome also uh, enrolled in the higher frequency at uh, 22%. In terms of region background, the rest main included in the 42% and a true bifurcation region was presented in the 46%. In terms of a procedure, uh, average stent size of 3.1 mm and the gradual balloon size is uh, relatively larger at uh, 2.7 mm. Pot or pot-like inflation was performed in the 85% uh, 
as the size of the brown is a 3.6 millimeter. And the final solvent dilation uh, glider balloon alone is uh, 92 percent. And all procedure guided by the IBUS or OCT or OFDI. This is the imaging analysis immediately after glider balloon dilation. In terms of the malar position, it occurred more frequently in the side branch side and presented side branch opposite side only in 3.4% of the cases. Stent deformation at the bifurcation was observed only in the side branch side. Stent under expansion and malar opposition remained in the proximal member cell in 13%, which required an additional procedure. Rider balloon crossing failure was observed in 8.7%, but secondary failure after small balloon dilation was found only in 2.4%. Sideband stenting due to the dissection occurred in 1.4%. Stent deformation due to glider balloon dilation was found in 5.8%. Of them, correction by lip pot was performed in 2.4%. Free from additional procedure due to the failure induced by glider balloon dilation was found in 92.8%. The additional procedure in the non-bifurcation site was performed in 24.6%. Finally, 68.1% was free from any additional procedure after glider balloon dilation. In 85% of the case, we obtained the follow-up CAG at one year. A QCA results show that a proximal member cell, decimal member cell, uh, it remains a lower value in the follow-up uh, period. And also in the side branch, uh, here you can see uh, the 30% uh, diameter stenosis remained at the follow-up period. This is a clinical outcome at one year follow-up. Uh, target region revascularization 7.2%, cardiac death 2.1%, myocardial infarction 2.1%, stent thrombosis 1.0%. So, all uh, major adverse cardiac event, including uh, them, uh, showed a 10.3%, which are uh, acceptable for the uh, bifurcation region. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my conclusion slide. Advantage of ultra short balloon for side band dilation is the following less member system deformation, avoid proximal member cell over dilation, preserved round and uniform member system dilation, and less side branch injury. Combination with pot plus side branch with ultra short balloon in the clinical study demonstrated that acceptable acute and chronic result. And the report is not necessary in 70% of the cases. Thank you for your attention. I will start. Um, Yoshi, anytime uh, I select uh, short uh, balloons, uh, I have the problem in uh, being uh, stable during the inflation. Is there any, this uh, ultra short, uh, I mean, in, looks uh, fantastic, but uh, uh, how often uh, you have to reinflate due to movement in precise uh, uh, placement? Yes, uh, the precise, uh, precise um, uh, uh, location uh, is very important. So uh, this balloon has uh, one marker. So the marker should be located, the rim of the stand, the side branch, that means the side branch ostium. So uh, we should uh, confirm the precise location of the marker at the limb of the stand. Uh, so uh, we use the uh, fluoroscope view, which can provide wide uh, bifurcation angle. Uh, in such situation, uh, we confirm. So, uh, and uh, we have a concern that balloon slippage uh, to the distal when we use a uh, ultra short balloon. However, side branch dissection uh, requires the side branch stenting only a uh, 1.4%. 
one case, uh, we fail the precise uh, location of the balloon uh, in the rim of the stand, uh, so uh, that balloon slippage to the distal, uh, which causes the spiral dissection. However, uh, after uh, that event, we learn uh, from the precise uh, positioning is important. The precise positioning uh, is a key for the uh, success of all this technique. Can you, can you describe, describe the balloon? Which kind of balloon is that? What is the length and what is the size of the balloon? Uh, four millimeter length uh, we usually use. And uh, so, and what about what is the sides? The sides. He's asking for the sides as well, the diameter. Diameter, uh, uh, spiral dissection, uh, 3.0 millimeter. Uh, no, no, the, the size of the balloon, which size is it coming? Is it 2.5, 30? Uh, uh, 2.5, 3.0, 3.5, that is all. And how you And why you cannot use, just a second, why you cannot use a regular balloon? Short, let's say a Pantera 6, 3 by 6. Uh, it can uh, use the subsidized with a glider balloon. Uh, so a oh, six millimeter balloon has a two marker. Uh, so proximal marker should be located at the uh, side branch of Austrian. Uh, the, we, uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Kume, uh, proposed recently uh, proximal balloon edge direction method. Uh, so the, another key point for this technique is uh, uh, proximal side of the balloon, not to touch the opposite, side branch opposite side. So a uh, long balloon is likely to occur stent deformation, like uh, stent uh, straightening, uh, balloon straightening. So not to touch uh, the side branch opposite side location is important. So six millimeter balloon is, uh, can be used, uh, subsidized with a glider balloon. One more question from Manuel Pan. In your, in your routine clinical practice, uh, uh, what proportion of uh, this short balloon is used uh, versus a conventional kissing balloon? Right now, in your, your daily practice, you change everything and you only use the, the glider balloon or, or you combine kissing for some case or what is your... Uh, yeah. Thank you for a oh, good question. Uh, 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 in my practice, 70% of the case, uh, we uh, switch uh, this technique, pot plus uh, side ventilation with ultra short balloon. 30% uh, of the case, well, we still use a uh, kissing balloon inflation because the uh, uh, side branch region, significant side branch region, or narrow angled bifurcation, uh, we uh, still use the uh, final kissing balloon inflation uh, in such region because in such region, uh, cardinal shift is likely to occur uh, after side branch dilation. In such case, uh, we use uh, the final kissing balloon inflation. Uh, Dr. Guan? Yeah, actually, uh, this technique was tested in our live bench test in the Korean Bifurcation Club last week. And uh, we found that the beauty of this technique is we can finalize without the final kissing ballooning. But actually, in the bench test, we found that uh, your ultra short ballooning with PA, final PA, and compared with uh, just conventional technique with the final kissing ballooning, the result looks similar. So do you have any uh, evidence that uh, your technique is better than uh, the conventional final kissing ballooning? Uh, yes, uh, the next speaker, uh, um, Dr. Uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Watanabe uh, uh, presented the randomized trial pot plus side band direction and the conventional kissing ballon inflation. Uh, so uh, the result is uh, similar. Uh, however, there is no advantage uh, because the pot balloon location is important, uh, another key uh, for the uh, clinical study. And so for the bench testing, uh, we can uh, locate the precise uh, position of the pot balloon. The distal marker should be located uh, at the cardinal side. However, in the clinical setting, um, pot balloon slippage to the proximal or uh, operator hesitate the deep insert of the pot balloon. So in the clinical study, uh, actually a pot does not work. It's a wide expanding 
expansion uh, in the bifurcation core. Okay. Uh, so, 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 oh, it's, so it's maybe some advantage also that because you're using a very short balloon, it's much easier to sort of recross with the balloon into the side branch and it saves you some time. Uh, I mean, with longer big balloons uh, and regular NC balloons, sometimes you have quite a lot of resistance. The, uh, the glider balloon is a semi compressed balloon, however, four millimeter balloon. So the uh, the power of the uh, expansion is very strong compared to the regular uh, semi compressed balloon, as uh, my as in presented in my uh, presentation. Uh, so oh, the power of the expansion is uh, likely uh, is uh, similar as the non compliant balloon. <laughs> okay, last uh, short question with shorter answer. Yeah, congratulations for your data, it's uh, Olivier. Um, did you uh, analyze the cross-sectional area by imaging of the ostial distal main before and after uh, the dilatation of the side branch? Because what we see usually, it's a carina, sort of carina mobilization toward the distal main after this kind of uh, procedure. So that's the reason why I apply uh, kissing balloon inflation. I'm sorry, uh, I don't, uh, we don't uh, analyze uh, that thing. However, according to our experience, uh, the gel strut uh, completely removed most of the case uh, compared to the kissing balloon inflation. Okay, thank you. I think that, uh, thank you very much, uh, that uh, you already introduced the, the next uh, speaker that will be uh, Dr. Yasuke Watanabe uh, reporting on ProPot study. Yeah, Chairman, thank you for the invitation to present at the EBC 2021 meeting. The title of my presentation is Pot Technique versus Final Kissing Balloon Inflation in Coronary Bifurcation Regions. The randomized multicenter ProPot trial. This is my disclosure. So clinical implications of pot technique for bifurcation regions have not been investigated in a randomized control trial. So this trial aimed to investigate pot is superior in terms of center position compared with the conventional KBT in real-life bifurcation regions using OCT. So this study included, included 16 from Japan, 16 institutes, and uh, Enrollment number was 120. So this study was prospective open level randomized study for, designed to compare an efficacy of pot and the KBT technique after impression, implantation of resolute integrity or onikis. So pot dilatation was mandatory just after stent implantation and before side branch wiring in pot group. Classical KBT was applied in KBT group. So this slide shows inclusion criteria and also shows exclusion criteria. So additional treatment, including report or additional KBT was allowed after procedure completion for cases with stent marrow position over 400 micrometer from the vessel wall in any part of the stent. Which additional treatment, report or additional KBT would be chosen by operator's discretion. So Primary endpoint of this study was rate of malaposed strut post procedure assessed by OCT. So for OCT analysis, we divided stent part, five part, uh, stent proximal edge, instant proximal, quads proximal edge, and bifurcation core and quads distal edge. So we assessed uh, malaposed strut rate and rate of gel strut in each uh, segment. So this slide shows study steps. So after enrollment, we divided patient into two groups with randomization. A pot group and KBT group, each group was 60 patients. OCT was performed before side branch dilatation and after side branch dilatation. So if there is a need of additional treatment, uh, we performed additional treatment in both group. And finally, finally OCT was performed and uh, this OCT was assessed as a primary endpoint analysis. So for baseline patient demographics, there are no significant difference between two groups except uh, the dyslipidemia date. And as you can see, for baseline region demographics, so left main disease were low in both group 
and 1.7% of KBT group and 3.5% in pot group. And the target vessel were mainly left ascending, left anterior descending artery and 70% in each group. Through bifurcation was 30% in both group. So this slide shows procedural outcomes. So stent diameter was 2.9 in both group. Port balance size was 3.4 in port group. And in KBT group, main vessel balance size was 2.9. And the side branch balance size was 2.3. This slide shows procedural outcomes. So additional treatment were performed in port group for 40%. And uh, in KBT group, 6.9%. And there was significant difference. In pot group, additional treatment was mainly report sequence. And in terms of the procedural time, fluoroscopic time, wire recrossing time for side branch, and the amount of cost last were not significant between two groups. This slide shows primary endpoint. So rate of malar position were not different between two groups in each or she, e, e, each stand segment, but slightly higher rate of in of the for the pot group. And this slide shows rates of malar pose start in each, each strut level and before side branch dilatation and final procedure. So for final procedure, as you can see, there were no significant difference between two groups compared to the port and the KBT group. This slide shows rate of gel strut at the bifurcation core. So in port group, uh, before side branch dilatation, gel uh, strut was six, 16% and 10% in the final. In the KBT group, 15% of the before side branch dilatation. And finally, there was a 7.6%. And there are no significant difference. So this slide shows one year outcome. So as you can see, TLR was uh, observed in the one patient in port group and one patient in KBT group. So in summary, so malar posed strut struts, strut rates around the bifurcation were not significantly different between port and KBT groups. JL strut rates at the side branch ostium before side branch treatment or at final OCT did not differ between the groups. No significant difference in stent area, stent eccentric index, dissection rate, procedure time, fluoroscopic time, side branch wire crossing time, and amount of contrast were observed between groups. One year clinical outcomes were excellent in both groups. So possible reasons for why there were no significant difference and uh, non superiority report followed by side branch dilatation over conventional KBT include the port balloon might not have been correctly placed and the visualization of the actual part of the carina by angiography was not correct and the KBT balloon size was large enough to effectively reduce malar position as the proximal main vessel and bifurcation core. So target regions are mainly located in the LAD and the left main regions are accounted for only uh, very few patients, so which may not reflect a certain benefit derived from pot in bifurcation with large vessel tapering. So in conclusion, in this randomized study, uh, regarding treatment following cross over stating in coronary bifurcation regions, pot followed by side branch dilatation did not show any advantages over conventional KBT in terms of stent at position or procedural convenience. However, the excellent midterm clinical outcomes were observed in both strategies. Further trials are required to confirm the long-term clinical benefit of pot for bifurcation regions. Thank you for hearing. So thank you very much. I, okay, so first, uh, I, I, I was saying that uh, it is expected to have discussion about this trial. So Dr. Guan uh, is starting. Thank you. Uh, can we have a chance to uh, first uh, discussion? So I think uh, I have uh, three uh, suggestions to, uh, the, for the design of the study, actually. So. Inclusion criteria should be limited to the bifurcation lesion with a large side branch, uh, at least larger than 2.5 or 2.3 at least, which comes with a large discrepancy of sizes between proximal and distal main vessels. So you selected the 2.0, the discrepancy is not so large, so you cannot show 
the benefit of a part in this study. And second is that the primary endpoint, uh, I think the stent expansion is better uh, and the point to understand the position because it's more clinically relevant. You can analyze the data again. So, and uh, actually, uh, I, uh, if I understand correctly, the, your design is too complex. So, if you measure the uh, 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 perform the OCT just after part, just after KBT, without any further examination. The further uh, procedure, it will be clear to compare KBT and OCT. Mm -hmm. yeah, KBT mm -hmm. part. Yeah. Thank you, Francesco. One essential thing is uh, to try to understand if uh, the procedure was just a uh, check uh, with the OCT or was uh, guided uh, by OCT. That is a substantial difference. And especially when uh, you saw that uh, in the part uh, there was uh, many additional interventions so we would like to listen the author and explain in how they uh, deal uh, with this, this aspect. Uh, uh, instead of uh, the Dr. Watanabe, I uh, answered. Uh, the, thank you for the, uh, the comment. Uh, the, actually, uh, the, this study, uh, the OCT, uh, OCT is used for uh, the uh, the observation, only observation. So uh, the decision uh, is um, made by angel guide. Uh, so all oh, the uh, pot balance sites or stand sites, uh, it's decided by angel guide. So maybe a pot balloon oh, is relatively small uh, actual uh, vessel size. And uh, the location of pot, oh, the, we try to uh, confirm oh, the uh, actual position uh, in the fluoroscopy was sent to boost view. Uh, however, uh, the, yesterday, Dr. To uh, demonstrated the uh, pot balloon longitudinal slippage uh, from the cardinal position. Uh, in such kind of the, uh, the, uh, the phenomenon occur uh, in the study. Uh, so uh, compared to my study, uh, to the, uh, this study, uh, the, uh, the result is uh, slightly uh, different. Uh, the uh, pot plus size manipulation did not show the uh, superior, superiority over the conventional KBT. Uh, we expected this uh, superiority, however, there is no uh, single advantage. Uh, that is the uh, uh, angel guidance. Uh, and uh, the next is uh, precise position and smaller uh, pot balloon. That is the uh, uh, reason of why uh, this study does not show the advantage of the pot blood side ventilation uh, over conventional kiss and balloon inflation. Uh, and the stent expansion is very important. Now we uh, analyze the stent expansion and uh, sub-analysis. Okay, so I think that there was a discussion. I, I, I uh, thank you very much for you because this is a, uh, uh, an ABC driven uh, study because uh, uh, the idea came from bench test and uh, this generated the because in bench test you cannot look for under expansion and so what was uh, apparent into the into the bench test was uh, malapposition that can be favored by this uh, technique and uh, practicing it uh, into the, the patients it was not so impactful. I think that it is uh, in harmony with the concept that the pot is uh, something that is very easy to be precisely applied into the bench test. But when you go into the, the patients, you are, you are afraid to go too deep to, with the, the position. This uh, jeopardizes a little bit the possibility to reach the perfect position. And uh, at the end, the side branch balloons, since that uh, it is not so easy because there is a subgroup of patients who required, on the basis of imaging, additional interventions. This means that uh, the pot and kissing sequence seems to be more predictable because in the absence of additional 
possible intervention, you have a reproducible results. In my mind, this is uh, the clinical message I can get. Okay, I saw that there was one more question, but in the interest of time, we move forward. Next presentation will be by Yoshi Onuma, and will be bifurcation QCA, fractal low QCA, and instantaneous wave free ratio for the assessment of distal left main stenosis from Paul Bostadi. Welcome. So this is the analysis of uh, bifurcation QCA, fractal low QCA, and instantaneous wave-free ratio for the assessment of uh, distal left main stenosis. So I present uh, on behalf of the uh, uh, Professor Sirais and also Professor Gill, and also the investigator of uh, Paul Bo's studies. So this slide, just to show that the, uh, we are dealing with the really the complex three-dimensional object when you do the uh, angiography of uh, left main. For example, in this case, this, uh, you can see the, in this view, you can see the ostium, the left main branch, but if you are, want to focus on the distal left main, you need to go for the different view and correctly select the uh, projection which can depict, depict the uh, complex anatomy of the left main. So in this case, the, uh, we are really uh, kind of the uh, downgrading the 3D information into the 2D. That's the challenge of the angiography. So uh, as you know, the uh, single vessel QCA alg algorithm ignores this uh, natural anatomy of the bifurcation. There's uh, no tapering taken into account. So in this particular case, that's the uh, using the single vessel analysis, the MLA was, M MLD was 1.3, but that percentile the stenosis is 55%. If you use the bifurcation dedicated QCA, it taking into account the uh, uh, bifurcation and natural tapering, so the time to stenosis becomes 48%. And in addition, especially in the case of the diffuse left main disease, the implementation of fractal laws, finite law or the Murray law or who or Kassav laws uh, to the QCA method can further improve its accuracy. So uh, Provo's trial was designed uh, as a prospective mass center single arm study in patients with an indication for the unprotected distal left main revascularization. The objective was to establish the safety and efficacy of the biostream C with respect to the patient-oriented composite endpoint. And uh, this was the uh, device used in this Provo's trial. Uh, this was the uh, uh, patient flow. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, uh, enrollment of the trial was on hold due to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, since March 2020. However, in the uh, uh, inclusion, one of the inclusion criteria was actually a confirmation of the stenosis, angiographic diameter stenosis of equal or greater than 50% confirmed by the offline QCA using dedicated QCA bifurcation software by academic CORAP. So in this study, we implemented sort of the central core up. So if the investigator send uh, uh, images to the uh, uh, academic team, then we did the analysis of the uh, dedicated bifurcation QCA report. So in this case, it's actual case. So you see the uh, uh, diameter stenosis was 51%, left main difference vessel diameter was three uh, millimeter. However, if you look at the main branch and side branch, the reference vessel diameter is actually larger than left main difference diameter, 3.25 for the LED and 3.15 uh, for the circumflex. So we used the, also the finite uh, uh, low uh, um, uh, equation. So we provide also the reference vessel diameter according to the finite row, which is 4.33, and the diameter stenosis according to the finite row in this case was 66%. So. Um, these are the report uh, sent in during this trial of the enrollment, initial enrollment. Uh, so uh, we provide this kind of the report to the investigator uh, at the time that each patient is enrolled. Uh, and I'm going to present the uh, uh, preliminary result of the 120 cases included in this analysis. So the, uh, in the 120 patients, the diameter stenosis of left main was uh, on average 52%, MLD was 2.02, and difference vessel diameter was 4.15 millimeter. We also had a, a QCA based on the finite row, so the diameter stenosis was uh, based, uh, calculated based on the reference vessel diameter of the LAD and the circumflex. Uh, however, in this uh, 120 patient, the reference vessel diameter was not so much changed. It was uh, uh, initially 4.145 and it became 4.11. Uh, 
person dying with stenosis was not so different, probably because of the fact that the uh, inclusion was the distal left main, so that there was uh, some uh, healthy vessel remaining in the uh, proximal or the ostial uh, region of the left main. So if you look at the highest uh, diameter stenosis, the location of the highest diameter stenosis was mainly in the left main, 72 cases, uh, followed by the 42 cases uh, where the location of the highest diameter stenosis was in uh, LAD, and in six cases, the uh, high highest diameter stenosis was uh, in circumflex. Uh, on average, uh, percent diameter stenosis was 60%. So uh, this is a distribution of the Medina classification defined by the uh, dedicated purification QCA. You can see that the majority of the cases, 52% of the cases, has the Medina classification of 100, followed by the uh, 010, 23%, and uh, 110, 16%. Uh, uh, so if you look at the uh, concordance or discordance of the visual assessment of the Medina by investigator versus the QCA-based uh, Medina classification, you can see that the agreement was only achieved in 65%. For example, if you look at the 111 region by a visual assessment, there was a nine cases the investigator said that it is a 111 region, but if you use the QCA, only one case uh, fulfill this uh, criteria of the 111. So basically, most of the case, the visual assessment is overestimating the uh, uh, Medina classification. Uh, this is the comparison between the QCA and the functional assessment. In this uh, trial, the IFR was used systematically to uh, look into the significance of the significance of the recommend stenosis, either towards the LAD or the circumflex. Uh, you can see that the uh, on average IFR is very low in LAD 0 0.80 and the circumflex 0 0.88. If you look at the agreement between the uh, bifurcation QCA, we use a cutoff of 50% uh, versus the IFR 0.89. The agreement was 86.7%. If you use, we use the bifurcation QCA. If we, we use the FINET, the agreement was slightly low, uh, lower 76% in this population. AUC was 0 0.60 and 0 0.59, uh, respectively. Uh, so this was a just descriptive uh, analysis of the QCA. What would be the next step? So uh, we would like to also look into the uh, assessment of the physiological uh, 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 pressure drop based on the QCA. So we will uh, try to calculate the uh, QFR in the both branches, and uh, we will use some dedicated method to calculate the QFR in the circumflex. We are also collaborating with uh, Professor Tu, who will be also the speaker uh, later this today. Uh, he has this uh, new QFR uh, software, which is based on a single uh, geographic view, and uh, initial publication showed that uh, quite good accuracy. So we apply this uh, method just to see that how the software uh, looks like, and we will also uh, do some uh, uh, validation in this cohort. So the, uh, as a conclusion, in a single arm clinical study of the distal left main, the angiographic eligibility was confirmed by central offline bifurcation QCA. And uh, in this preliminary analysis, the agreement of the Medina a classification between visual assessment versus bifurcation QCA was only 65%. So I think QCA is very important to make a, a good uh, uh, clinical decision of uh, indication of treatment. Also, the diagnostic performance of bifurcation QCA in predicting a positive IFR was moderate with the QCA. Further investigation is ongoing to assess the diagnostic performance of angiography-based functional analysis in left main. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much. We, we have observed in, uh, in, in the past with a randomized trial from, uh, for, the, for example, the Nordic, a deviation between the intention uh, for a, um, including patient and what was really included. For example, uh, Nordic 4 was supposed to treat uh, bifurcation lesion with a side branch of at least uh, 275. And in fact, it was less than 2.5. So the, this centralized uh, uh, validation for including the patient is something new. Can you describe for the audience uh, what, what kind of, uh, of organization you have to do this? Uh, so in this trial, uh, actually we did uh, central core of analysis. So the, when the patient had the informed consent for the sending angiography to the core up, 
then uh, we receive the uh, angiographic uh, um, materials. And then with the uh, bifurcation QCA software, we did the analysis and sent back the result to the investigator. And uh, I must say that the uh, turnover time for that uh, analysis was quite quick uh, because it was simple QCA and uh, it took approximately, I think, 43 minutes uh, in median uh, uh, duration. And we provide also the uh, uh, reference vessel diameter of the finet, uh, difference vessel diameter according to the uh, QCA software so that the uh, operator can plan the procedure a little bit more precisely uh, rather than the visual assessment. So can, may I see the, the, the panelists as well? Hi, okay, so I, I have question. Angela, Angela, okay. Hi, thanks. That's a, that was a lovely presentation. I mean, certainly we were all brought up to understand that angiography is not particularly useful at determining significance of left main stenosis. So I think this software potentially is a, is a forward step. My concern um, is that because the left main bifurcation can be so complex, sometimes you need more than one view to really understand where the, the plaque is. You know, what might be one view that particularly shows the LAD is not the same view that you want to look at the circumflex in. So I just wondered if you could comment about whether doing this on a single plane angiogram is helpful or whether actually doing a 3D reconstruction might add, you know, a, a lot more information. I think uh, I totally agree with you, and that's the why I show the some CT images in the beginning because it's really the a complex 3D structure, and we have to look it into the 2D plane. So that's always difficult, and you're right, especially if there's a. Uh, stenosis in the ostium of the left main, you need to have a different view. The only thing in this trial is it's only the uh, left main, distal left main disease. So most of the case, majority of the case, doesn't have a uh, ostia lesion. But I must say that the, sometimes it's challenging to see the uh, lesion only in one view. And I think, uh, uh, yeah, ideally the 3D reconstruction either based on angiography or CT might be a uh, uh, increase the accuracy of the of the this uh, detection of stenosis. Yes. Yeah, I think a, a, a good a good reading for uh, Angela is the paper of uh, Nicolo Piazza, which has converted systematically uh, what is seen on the multi slice CT scan from 3D to 2D. Uh, some of these projection optimal projection are not achievable. I mean, uh, so it, it the scatter plot you could see. But in general, it's very useful to uh, work on the multi slice CT scan to say tomorrow I will go in that projection because the projection with the maximal angle, that's point number one, no overlap of the ostium of LED uh, circumflex and potentially less foreshortening because you can judge that too. So I think it's, uh, we discussed that on day one that uh, uh, the planning based on multi slice CT scan, I, I think that's something which is coming very strongly. Um, how far are we then from uh, having the QFR so automated that we can actually do this online in the cath lab and then make the decision not within 34 minutes uh, that it takes to send this back to the core lab, but to do it online uh, during the procedure? and also check the stenting result at the end, also with uh, QFR, bifurcation QFR. I think, yeah, you're right. I think you can do, of course, you can do the online. And uh, yeah, I think if you have uh, stuff to do the uh, uh, QCA or QFR during the procedure, that would be, I think, optimal. And also check the result. As you said, that is probably a very important to achieve the uh, you know, final QFR of greater than 0 0.91, and that could be done only during the procedure, so. Okay, thank you very much. We move forward. Oh, very last question, just, short. Just one, one short question. Has anybody tried to use rotational angiography with the QFR software? Rotational angiography uh, on top. No, I have never heard about the rotational angiography during the uh, acquisition of the QFR. So, uh, yeah, I'm not aware of them. Okay, so uh, next speaker will be Abdelakin Alali. 
impact of lesion preparation technique on side branch compromise in calcified coronary bifurcations. Dear Chairman, uh, thank you for the invitation to present at the Euro uh, Bifurcation Club 2021. The title of my presentation is <clears throat> Impact of Lesion Preparation Technique <clears throat> on Side Branch Compromise in Calcified Coronary Bifurcations. This is a subgroup analysis of the prepared calc trial. The prepared calc trial was a randomized trial in which 200 patients with severe calcified coronary lesions were randomized one to one to either strategy of scoring cutting balloon or rotation in atherectomy, followed by implantation of the serolimus eluting stent. As you can see, the primary endpoint of the trial was strategy success and was significantly higher in the group of patients treated with rotation in atherectomy. In the main trial, we observed a trend towards more compromised side branch at the end of the procedure in the group of patients treated with scarring cutting balloon. But that was a per protocol analysis and side branch compromise was not clear, clearly defined in the protocol of the main trial. So we decided to focus on this group of patients. Uh, this was a post hoc as treated analysis of lesions located at bifurcation segment. So patients in those crossover from scoring cutting balloon to rotation atherectomy was uh, done were included in the rotation atherectomy group. Two interventional cardiologists, none included in the main trial, revealed all coronary angiograms and index procedures to collect more details concerning the anatomy of the bifurcation, the steps of the PCI, and uh, the angiographic region uh, result at the bifurcation. And the primary endpoint of this analysis was compromised side branch and was defined as any significant stenosis of more than 70%, any dissection of the side branch or final TME lower than three. Here is the study flow chart, as you can see, from 278 lesions included in the trial, 14 lesions were crossover from rotation atherectomy, uh, from scoring cutting balloon to rotation atherectomy in the bifurcation group. And finally, the scoring uh, cutting balloon group included 47 lesions in 43 patients, and uh, the uh, rotablation group were 68 lesions in 61 patients. Here you can see the baseline characteristics, which were comparable between the two groups uh, with a more uh, uh, previous Mercadian infraction in the scoring cutting balloon. The mean age was uh, 75 years. And uh, the angiographic characteristics were also balanced within the groups and uh, lesions were mainly located in the left anterior descending artery. And the true bifurcation was uh, the case in 49 person in scarring cutting balloon versus 43 person in rotation atherectomy group. Concerning uh, procedural characteristics, we observed uh, um, more implanted uh, stents per lesions in the scarring cutting balloon group. Other procedural characteristics were comparable. And concerning the uh, bifurcation uh, treatment, uh, as you can see, um, uh, kissing uh, uh, or balloon dilatation in the side branch was performed in about uh, uh, one third of the included lesions. Um, mm -hmm. We performed mainly one stent technique and the most used two stent technique was uh, kilot stenting. Concerning the primary endpoint of this analysis, compromised side branch at the end of the procedure were significantly higher in the scoring cutting balloon uh, with 31.5.9 compared to rotation atherectomy a group with 7.4%. And that was mainly due to a um, higher rate of significant stenosis at the end of the procedure. In uh, polyprocedural complications, we observe uh, a higher rate of large dissection in the scoring cutting balloon group compared to rotation atherectomy. 
And uh, when we observe the biomarkers in patients with compromised side branch versus no compromised side branch, we observe a higher uh, periprocedural elevation of the cardiac biomarkers in uh, patients with uh, compromised side branch. This study has uh, some limitations. That was a post hoc analysis included about one half of the patients included in the main trial. Uh, uh, the study was not power, uh, powered for the detected difference. So the results should be considered hypothesis uh, generating. And uh, concerning the number of three bifurcation lesions, uh, lesion preparation with scoring cutting balloon or rotation atherectomy in the side branch was performed in a very limited number of uh, uh, lesions. Um, in the conclusion, uh, we will say that in severely calcified coronary bifurcation lesions, we observe significantly higher rate of compromised side branch in the group of patients treated with a scarring cutting balloon compared to rotation atherectomy. Side branch compromise was associated with more extensive periprocedural myocardial injury. So in calcified bifurcation lesions, an upfront rotation atherectomy with, uh, with its debulking uh, effect uh, could optimize the result in the side branch. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you. We have the pleasure to have uh, Dr. Alali with us. I think that is very important uh, data you, you reported because calcific lesions are a very important topic. We have first question from uh, Dr. Asali. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Which scoring balloon did you use in the study? Because we know that some of the scoring balloons are very bulky and maybe this is the reason let's say angioscalp is not an easy balloon to use. And I imagine that if you push the angioscalp in the side branch, you may compromise the side branch. So which scoring balloon did you use? Um, patients was, were treated with either scoring or cutting balloon. In the prepared CAC uh, trial, uh, we used more scoring balloon than cutting balloon. And we used both uh, angioscalp and scoreflex. And angioscalp was used more than angios, uh, angio, uh, more, uh, than scorflex, and so, uh, the uh, the predilatation was mainly performed in the main branch, not in the side branch. In very very limited number of patients, si uh, the scoring balloon was used in the in the side branch. So this is very did you important. see any difference between the two scoring balloon? Sorry, did you see any difference of the outcome between the two scoring balloon you used? Uh, we didn't uh, analyze it. Adverse. We didn't analyze this point. Dr. Guan? Yeah. Can you, uh, very nice study. Can you tell me the, the bore to artery ratio? That I like to know the, the, how much debulking is needed to, uh, to prevent the side risk compromise. And also, the, when the bore to artery ratio is higher, is there any possibility to a uh, high probability? Of, uh, to, to prevent uh, the side branch occlusion? The bore to artery issue was about uh, 0.52 in the trial. Yeah. Did you expect it more or less according to the results, Dr. Guan? I mean, I mean the, the maybe 1.5 or at, least, uh, at most 1.75 bore is used for debulking, I, I expect. And when the vessel uh, size is large, the photo artery ratio is smaller. And uh, I like to know, in the, in the four millimeter vessel, you use a 1.5 millimeter bore, is it still effective to uh, prevent the side branch occlusion? Uh, sorry, I didn't get your question. No, uh, was a In the very large, large main vessel, in the very low photo artery ratio, because of the only we can use a 1.5, 1.75 millimeter to bore. Still, is it effective to prevent the side branch compromise? So Small bore in large vessel, is it effective? Um, may it be effective. Um, uh, we think that the, the lower rate of compromise side branch in the rotational atherectomy group is, uh, we discussed this point, could be due to uh, two points. First, the debulking effect, so you have less 
a less plaque uh, uh, burden in that bifur bifurcation. Um, and secondly, in the cutting balloon group, we observed more dissection, and maybe this dissection uh, um, uh, went to the to the osteum of the side branch and caused more uh, more uh, compromise in the side branch. And uh, in our center, is it not rare? I think uh, each interventional cardiologist has been in this situation that sometimes to uh, access to a difficult side branch in a complex calcified lesion. We do some debulking to make this osteum free and to access to the side branch and could be also an explanation. We have uh, Manuel Pan. Did you protect uh, the side branch with a guide wire in the group of scoring cutting balloon? Uh, yes, in 70% uh, in of cases. Yeah. In the rotablation, I suppose, no. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, other, other question here? I Dr. Asali, yes, it's your. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think that in these days, once we have the shockwave, it will be very nice to to start to make a study, and to see if using the shockwave in the bifurcation calcified lesion will be better than the the rotablation, because it's much more easier to do that. So I think a study comparing rotablation with shockwave will be very nice in this in this uh, kind of uh, patients. For sure. We have now this new tool and it will be interesting. To yeah, actually, it. there is a in plan to perform a study with IDL in the side branch as a kind of uh, optimal lesion preparation. Uh, so we have to wait for, for, for the study results. However, here it was concentrated in the main vessel. It is important to, to, uh, to come back to this concept. This was a lesion preparation in the main vessel yeah. mainly. Okay. Francesco, but should I make Giulio. a point? Giulio. Okay, and the point is that despite the fact that uh, Angel is uh, a little bit more reliable when we are talking about severe calcification, I think in a severe calcified lesion, the role of imaging is essential for decision making. The European Association of uh, Percutaneous Intervention is finishing the documents highlighting how much is important to guide the procedure based upon the fact uh, calcium distribution and the length and the thickness. Uh, so I think uh, that uh, this study is uh, very interesting, but uh, should be at least uh, replicated uh, by using the right things. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, actually, in uh, the prepared calc trial, we, we did uh, uh, OCT, also analysis. Uh, all patients received uh, OCT, almost all patients, if possible, received OCD post and pre uh, uh, procedure. And uh, the high uh, calcified score was uh, confirmed by the OCT analysis. And uh, the core lab uh, confirmed also the uh, high degree of calcification in the angio. It was not included in this uh, uh, slides, but that have been confirmed. In so it would be also yeah. interesting to see if there are differences in the expansion of the stent at the, the end of the procedure according to the different uh, strategy of lesion preparation. So thank you very much for sharing. Welcome I think and that thank was you for the invitation. Very nice uh, uh, study. And uh, we move forward uh, with uh, Donald Catlip. Uh, anatomic and flow characteristics of LAD angiographic stenosis predisposing to MI. Dear Chairman, thank you for the invitation to present at the 2021 EBC meeting. The title of my presentation is Anatomic and Flow Characteristics of LAD Lesions Predisposing to ST Elevation Myocardial Infarction. I'm happy to present these results on behalf of my co-authors shown here, and especially want to recognize Demos Castridis, who uh, designed and uh, led the research. The results have been published previously earlier this year in the American Journal of Cardiology. By way of background, we know that myocardial infarction occurs more frequently at sites of moderate stenosis, although this may be a denominator issue with many more of those lesions present. We also know that culprit lesions that progress to myocardial infarction are not uniformly distributed, but tend to cluster at specific anatomic regions. Our objective for this study was to test whether we could identify lesion, anatomic, and flow characteristics 
that would be associated with subsequent ST elevation myocardial infarction involving the left anterior descending coronary artery. We then hope to develop a lesion risk score to test for prediction of future risk. We began with paired angiograms from 90 subjects who presented with LAD STEMI and who had had an angiogram within the prior six to 12 months. Within the LAD, we identified corporate lesions as a site of eventual occlusion, and other lesions within the LAD were considered to be stable lesions. The subjects were divided into a derivation cohort, including 200 lesions and 61 subjects, and a validation cohort of 95 lesions and 29 subjects. The angiographic analysis and computational flow dynamics were performed using 3D reconstruction algorithm by the Coronary Flow Research Unit at Hygieia Hospital in Athens. The angiographic parameters of interest are shown here on the left and included stenosis severity, distance from the LAD osteum, lesion length, distance from bifurcation, lesion symmetry, and computational flow simulation. Our goal was to develop a logistic regression model of the significant angiographic predictors first in the derivation cohort with an optimal threshold determined using ROC curve analysis for each of the significant angiographic parameters. We then developed an integer score based on the model coefficients and tested the proposed score for prediction of progression to a culprit lesion and eventual STEMI. In terms of the baseline characteristics, not uh, on a, Unexpected for a STEMI population, the patients are relatively young. They're mostly male. Only about 20% had uh, diabetes at baseline. There's a rather high incidence of current smoking in 36% of the subjects. The time between the baseline angiogram and the eventual STEMI was about seven months. And in addition to the culprit stenosis, there were approximately 2.3 uh, other lesions in the LAD considered as stable lesions. There were significant differences between culprit stenosis and stable lesions. The culprit stenoses were more severely stenotic. They were much closer to the LAD osteum. They were slightly longer in length. Importantly, nearly 90% of the culprit lesions were in proximity to a bifurcation, in addition to those that were close to the LAD osteum. The lesions tended to be more symmetric and they were slightly more angulated than the stable stenoses. To look at a couple of the most important parameters uh, and look at the impact of stenosis and lesion location, over 70% of the culprit lesions at baseline were greater than 60% uh, stenosed. And again, over 70% of the lesions were within 40 millimeters of the LAD origin. The results of the multivariable model are shown here. The most significant predictors were diameter stenosis, at least 55%. Distance from the LAD origin less than 50 millimeters and proximity to a bifurcation. We found that a score greater than 10 was the optimal cutoff based on ROC curve analysis, and the results were confirmed in a validation cohort. As shown here on the left, the area under the curve, both for the derivation and the validation cohorts, was greater than 0.9. And if we look at lesion score as a predictor of eventual culprit stenosis, there's an exponential relationship with higher score, a much uh, uh, better predictor of eventual culprit progression. I wanna look at just two examples of uh, computational flow characteristics. First in a moderate stenosis of about 50% and then in a more severe stenosis of 90%. Shown here on the left is a culprit lesion identified because of its proximity to a bifurcation and we see even with a rather moderate stenosis, there is flow recirculation at the origin of the side branch uh, predisposing to a eventual uh, thrombosis. If you look at a stable lesion defined by its distance from the bifurcation, the same moderate stenosis has no effect on flow recirculation and maintains laminar flow. If we look at the more severe 90% stenosis, again in the culprit lesion, proximal now to a bifurcation, we see flow recirculation both in the side branch as well as the main vessel, again, predisposing to a subsequent uh, state for thrombosis. In a stable lesion with a 90% with a stenosis, quite distal from a bifurcation, we see the flow is maintained mostly laminar, although there is some slight recirculation 
and the distal uh, vessel. So in conclusion, uh, baseline and geographic parameters of stenosis severity, distance from the LAD origin, and proximity to a bifurcation are significant predictors of subsequent LAD STEMI. There are, of course, several limitations, including this is a retrospective analysis beginning at the point in time uh, that a patient presented with STEMI. And of course, the findings are restricted to the left anterior descending coronary artery. I thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to uh, any questions during the discussion if time allows. Thank you. On my side, uh, I, uh, I am always interested on uh, looking at the possi possible additive value of fluid dynamics in predicting the events. But in this study, I mean, we saw tight lesion as well, where, uh, I mean, the indication probably for, for uh, uh, revascularization should be part of what we already achieved. So we are more interested in those patients with less uh, uh, tight uh, disease. And uh, in, in that regard, uh, we published with uh, Dr. Prati the CLIMA study in the European Art Journal showing that in mild LAD, proximal LAD disease, some OCT features, regardless of the fact that fluid dynamics was not assessed, but had impact like ma macrophage infiltration, fibrofatty, and there was also the uh, minimal lumen diameter, which means that the stenosis severity is uh, even in mild lesions might be part of the play. Can you comment on it? Yeah, yeah but t totally agree. Uh, obviously here it, it seems that we're missing some resolution coming from uh, intracoronary imaging like OCT or uh, IVUS, but um, definitely the, the concept of, as you said, of using anatomical imaging and as detailed as possible um, to uh, complement this with uh, flow dynamics um, and predict the vascular biology and the outcomes down the line. I think it's uh, indispensable. Of course, it's a proof of concept. We need uh, larger data. We need more detailed imaging. But the idea to predict outcomes, I think it's, uh, it's very important. Yep. OK. So we have uh, uh, first uh, Dr. Guan. Yeah. Thank you. So the data, data to me, uh, it, it looks to me is that the only about the plaque burden, so severity, definitely. The bifurcation, the, Dr. Fermani already showed that the abluminal side of uh, the vessel is abundant with the plaque, even abundant with the vulnerable plaque. And the proximal location, this is larger, the plaque is larger. Just about the plaque burden, not, uh, I don't have any idea, clues about the flow dynamics in this study, I think. So what do you think? So, Francesco, Julio, may I comment? Do you want to, yes, to comment and also to answer to this uh, tough uh, question by Dr. Guan? I am not able in doing it. <laughs> okay, uh, I personally think that uh, the main messages here are. Uh, in terms of future vulnerability, you needed to look uh, when uh, you have a patient with angel to some stenosis with uh, some degree. This is in line with uh, anatomy. The second is uh, heterogeneity and uh, recirculation of the flow. You saw the lengths longer compared to, compared to the stable, uh, located at the bifurcation, and uh, these data are absolutely in line with uh, the most recent uh, CT data integrating uh, the shear stress uh, and the heterogeneity of the shear stress uh, and the fluidodynamic. I personally don't think uh, that we can fully predict uh, vulnerable plaque by using only imaging. We should integrate uh, anatomical composition and eventually fluids including shear stress uh, to get uh, closer and closer to the prediction. Thank you. Actually, much. in this presentation, shear stress was lower in the ostium of side branch, but it is uh, related to a thrombus formation in a uh, prefuture MI. So black okay. blood is most important to me. <laughs> Thank you. So, Werner, Dr. Werner. Uh, the problem in this study, I think it is not telling us where the future infarct happens in the 
LED because it's a selection bias because you only have angels of patients who had been symptomatic by some uh, cause that we saw, severe stenosis. And so the true or what we learned that uh, the severity of a stenosis is not predicting the risk of infarct, I think ho probably holds true because the majority of patients will not have undergone an angio six months before. So that is, I think, a severe selective uh, yes. view. But, and my comment uh, on the bifurcation issue was in the LED, uh, uh, to be distal to a bifurcation is already being proximal to the next bifurcation. So <laughs> where is the cutoff value here? It is true, and also there is the problem of the angulation we discussed uh, during uh, the, the presentation regarding QCA, because always uh, the, the left main has an angulation of takeoff in, from the aorta and entering uh, the, the LED, so it is uh, complex uh, hemodynamics. So uh, we move forward, we have a last presentation that is by Khalid al Sadon and is on dedicated bifurcation stent bench testing. Dear Chairman, thanks for the uh, invitation to present uh, in the EBIC 2021 meeting. Uh, my presentation is dedicated bifurcated stent bench testing. My name is Khalid al uh, As you see, bifurcated silicone metal was used, two wires technique is used, and then you're gonna see a bifurcated balloon will be advanced with a stent to go to the main art, uh, main uh, branch. And then I will inflate the balloon uh, at first at six atmosphere. Uh, I'm gonna show you the inflation as it started. Uh, it will uh, open up the stent, the main uh, branch, and then there is a recoil. In, uh, there is not a good opening in the proximal part. Then I had to inflate again at 12 atmosphere and as I dictate again, there is not good opening in the proximal. We'll need a high pressure uh, balloon, uh, preferably bifurcated. And we have to understand that the uh, silicone uh, has a high recoil. Here, before we brought the uh, uh, high pressure balloon, I show you that there was no jailing to the flow to the side branch. And you can see it to the, uh, uh, the profile and also all the way when I show you and tried angle. Now this is the bifurcated high pressure balloon as you can see and behind it is the silicone uh, model at that I used. Um, now advancing the uh, bifurcated high pressure balloon uh, it, it was done with, with ease without any issues. Now inflating using a yellow dye just to make it clearer uh, for the balloon as it's inflated and I inflate all the way to 16 atmosphere to open up the proximal part. And as I deflate, it recoil, indicating that the silicon has a higher recoil uh, effect. I inflate again, and as I inflate the rupture, you can see soon the yellow dye in the other branch indicating the rupture. Uh, here is the uh, stent to the side of the branch. And as I magnify to show the uh, the two arms uh, in the design so they can fit in the main stand. Now, this is the difficulty facing uh, 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 advancing the uh, side branch uh, uh, stand. As I advance, I notice that it will uh, uh, start into the uh, strut of the main uh, stand. Also, because of the design, there's too much metal, there is no flexibility. Uh, understand that need to be uh, redesigned. With all of that, I managed to uh, push it all the way up. In the process of trying to have a better positioning, unfortunately, my balloon went down, and now I have to deploy it where it is. And as you can see, as I deploy, uh, deployed, it opened up, but then when the balloon rupture, it recoiled. That will need, uh, again, a high pressure balloon, bifurcated, and I well, again, I open the stand, but again, it will recoil. Now, in summary, uh, prov provisional or conditional stenting using dedicated bifurcated stent for main stent in a silicon model was successful. 
uh, uh, with a good alignment of the main stent of link to the soil in three. For the two stent technique, challenges was faced that will require modification of the soil branch stent design in order to achieve flexibility and trackability through the curving angles. Uh, a high pressure dedicated fabricated balloon is needed to optimize the result. A high recoil of the silicon model can affect the results of the finished test. Thank you. So we have first uh, uh, first uh, question by Thierry. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, one of the problems that we have seen in the bench uh, with uh, dedicated uh, stents is uh, wire bias, uh, which is a frequent problem. Of course, in the bench you can solve the problem, but in the patient it's more difficult. So did you experience that in, the, in your bench uh, testing? Uh, yeah, actually it was, uh, well, with, with, the, with the bench testing, it is easy because you see everything in front of your eyes. Um, but my main problem was, uh, my bench testing actually was done in my kitchen. Uh, not in a lab, and uh, so I'm limited with with the uh, with all of the uh, uh, better tools and better uh, equipment. Um, so uh, the idea was that this test is just to test my prototype. This is my first prototype that we did, and uh, if I may share something with you. And this is my idea at the beginning. Uh, so to share how stent, if you have a hole in the main stent and have dedicated fabricated balloon, then you can deploy it and you can avoid the pushing balloon. Uh, and then you bring the other stent that I showed. But this is the design, a hole in the main stent and the other side branch balloon. And this is a, a 90 degree angle. Now we are, I'm doing the 30 degree angle, uh, stent main and side branch. So it was just testing the prototype. So it is too early for me to tell you uh, how good it will be, but it was just an attempt. And I get this prototype just a month from the Epic, so they gave me the chance to show it. It's, I mean, it's a couple of things to think about are sort of the problems with the bulkiness of the device and also the uh, wire wrap that uh, sometimes makes it difficult. Uh, to get in and you have to pull back the wire and recross, etc. So, uh, but good luck. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Angela? Yeah, I just want to make a comment as well, just to, to also think about the difference in terms of the diameter of the distal main vessel and the proximal main vessel, which is obviously a theme that we've discussed over quite a few years. But I think, I think, you know, going forward in terms of the testing and the modeling, I think you probably need to also um, take that factor into account as well. Yeah, in 2016, I presented the first fabricated balloon that fit the Tony lock in which my proximal is uh, bigger and then my distal tapered down and my side branch is also tapered down. That fit the equation. So the sizes of the balloon will fit exactly the the the, the, the thingy, uh, law, uh, and that's how we are making it. And then we trim the uh, the stent on it, and it will open up. So the idea of the fabricated balloon, different sizes and different segment, will hopefully get rid of the missing balloon and maybe replace the top uh, technique. Uh, but time will tell. This is just a vision. And I'm still early, I'm still in the R&D, so don't take me for my word, but I hopefully I'll come back again and show more animal study in the future. Thank you. Uh, one more question? Yeah, very, very quickly, very quickly. So uh, do you, uh, trying to make it more clinically relevant and to extrapolate to human, um, do you have a sense what human plaque material this silicon model is closer to? No, unfortunately I don't. So uh, I, I just choose the silicon uh, model because you can see through. So, but uh, no, and uh, so I'm limited in that. that. That would be interesting to maybe investigate down the line because it's good to know whether we're expanding this stand against like something which is like uh, calcium-like, 
or fibrous-like, definitely it's not lipid-like. But I think it's going be, it would be very insightful for us to know how clinically relevant is the bench model, because this can generate more ideas and make it more for relevant. Sure. And, and we learn, and again, I mean, uh, in the refinement of devices, we learn a lot, uh, and the fact that uh, you are going stepwise testing and then uh, refining before moving, it's important. So. If